Max, one thing we learn on our journey from the Genesis block to the moon is that honey badger don't care. And 2014 is definitely a year for honey badger not to care. Honey badger don't care is the meme that best describes the anti-fragile nature of Bitcoin. Unlike, for example, a banking system that is fragile, whenever you have volatility, shock, stress, or any kind of impact or disturbance in Bitcoin, the system adapts, it grows, and becomes more resilient. So we use the honey badger uh, as an analogy because even though he might be small um, and might look offensive, you get a pack of lion uh, that attack a honey badger, and he's not going to care. They're not going to be able to do anything. He's too strong. So it's kind of like a Bitcoin spirit animal. Since it cannot be stopped and it cannot be changed significantly by any single party, so basically uh, even if uh, some kind of uh, user or union wants something different, even if some regulator wants something different, even if uh, uh, Silicon Valley VCs want something different from Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't care. And uh, so far, Bitcoin showed to be a pretty good pretty good uh, honey badger. He resisted to any kind of attempt to take it, take it over and change it fundamentally. You can just keep attacking it and attacking it and attacking it and it will not care. And in fact, it thrives when you attack it. Bitcoin has grown up on the internet. You know, Andreas Antonopoulos, a great speaker in the space, has a great saying, you know, saying that Bitcoin is the sewer rat. Because Bitcoin is born on the internet, it has been attacked 24-7 every single second of every single day for the past 10 years and it is still here, which is a testament to both uh, the, the original code that Satoshi put in there and the, the community that continues to shepherd it, that continues to, to take out things like zero days, to fix fix exploits, to do anything that needs to be, to fix anything that needs to be fixed so that the rest of the world can continue uh, transacting with this. So Honey Badger doesn't care, uh, to me just means um, that the, the power of the decentralization of Bitcoin and the fact that nobody uh, controls it. Remember, we ended 2013 with the U.S. government being one of the largest holders of Bitcoin in the world, thanks to their seizure of Ross Ulbricht and Silk Road's Bitcoin. It ends up being over 50,000 Bitcoin that they then auction off in 2014. But January 2014, we start the year with a friend of Kaiser report. January 26, 2014, BitInstant CEO charged with money laundering. Charlie Schramm, CEO of BitInstant, is arrested over allegations of money laundering in connection with Silk Road. He is arrested at JFK Airport for charges filed in a Manhattan federal court. Right, I remember meeting Charlie uh, outside of the office of Bit Instant near Silicon Alley in New York City, uh, meeting with Roger Ver as well, uh, who is uh, very active in the space. And um, a friend of ours, Matthew Mellon, was also active in the space and an investor in Bit Instant. And he was very excited about this new technology. And you went to the office and they had a ticker tape set up with the price of Bitcoin. And this is part of that first wave. Again, the pinwheels and the eyes. People that were transfixed by the technology who looked into the void of the coming fiat nightmare and were motivated to start a company and to take on the man. And of course, Charlie then met uh, the law. Of course, the thing is that we had just ended 2013 with the U.S. government seizing all these Bitcoin from Ross Albright, and then we saw the arrests of Charlie Schramm. And I have to say that I personally was suddenly like, wait, we at Kaiser Report have been talking about Bitcoin for the last three years, almost four years. And is this illegal? Like, what is going on? Are we going to get arrested? Is it okay to own this? What's happening? And it was a little bit scary at that point, even to think of flying into JFK again. When I got into Bitcoin a while back, I was afraid of government um, because we really saw that we were going after the actual moneymaker, right? So the creation of fiat currencies. And you can criticize government, you know, you can have debates on gun rights, you can have debates on, on a lot of things, but ultimately the government, um, it can just print money out of thin air. So it has this, this huge, huge power. And we thought there's no way they're going to they're gonna let us uh, uh, do that. The thing is, we managed to survive long enough 
And not to say that we're safe from governments. There's a lot of improvements that need to be done in Bitcoin, and there's a lot more to, to do. But I think over time, we demonstrated that it's very difficult to attack it, and a lot of people are using it. And it, it, I, I, I think we, we made the message clear that it is very, very, very difficult uh, for them to attack Bitcoin. Many people want to know what is going on at Mt. Gox, the Bitcoin exchange. I'll tell you what's wrong with Mt. Gox. Market making. Now, Mt. Gox stands for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. It started life as a place where you could <laughs> exchange Magic the Gathering cards for cash. And it ended up, not by design, obviously, but it became the place to go to trade Bitcoins as well. But William Bonsai has created a backstage look at what the Mt. Gox command node looks like. <laughs> As you see, it looks very 1950s. The exchange piece of the Bitcoin ecosystem, as I've been saying now all along, is the weakest link in the chain because you have people who are trying to adapt magic card trading systems for multi-billion dollar exchange uh, platforms, and they're not up to the task. February 7th, 2014, Mt. Gox halts. Bitcoin withdrawals. So at that point, it was just them halting Bitcoin withdrawals. Nobody was quite sure what was going on. Um, there had been some complaints from customers that they had problems with withdrawals. There was a notice from Mt. Gox to customers, dear Mt. Gox customers, in light of recent news reports and the potential repercussions on Mt. Gox's operations in the market, a decision was taken to close all transactions for the time being in order to protect the site and our users. We will be closely monitoring the situation and will react accordingly. Best regards, Mt. Gox team. Of course, they reacted accordingly by going into hiding. <laughs> well, we warned folks on Kaiser Report about Mt. Gox. We had our suspicions about Mt. Gox, the exchange. Having all the experience that I had on Wall Street and all the experience I, I had building an exchange in Los Angeles, uh, I was suspicious that this Mt. Gox platform could handle this volume and that there was no governance whatsoever, and that there was no redundancy whatsoever in the system. It was just a guy with a few wallets and all this Bitcoin. And we tried to warn people to get their coins off the exchange. Uh, and sure enough, whenever you hear the phrase, uh, they've halted withdrawals, uh, pretty much you know instantaneously, if you have any experience at all in the markets, that that is game over. And then on March 20th, 2014, Mt. Gox reported on its website that it found 199,999.99 Bitcoins worth around $116 million in an old digital wallet used prior to June 2011. Oops, we lost $116 million. It was under the sofa. We didn't notice. This is the sort of thing as well at that time that many people in the Bitcoin space were experiencing is because back in 2011, back in 2012, when Bitcoin was worth only a few bucks, you weren't really, and the services around Bitcoin weren't that professional. And it wasn't very easy to hold your own Bitcoin and, and keep them secure. You would often find a huge stash of Bitcoin that you had totally forgotten about from a few years earlier. And you're like, oops, I just found $200,000 on this old wallet. It was real easy to just nuke Bitcoins back then. Like none of the software supported it, you know, address verification, none, none of the software supported it. You could just put a one in the Bitcoin address field and it would send. Outside of losing keys back then, it was real easy to just accidentally nuke coins. Uh, so there's a lot of keys from the past that don't move often. And it's kind of fascinating because, you know, if you lose your keys, you're essentially adding value to the network. So thank you for losing your keys. Essentially, you're diminishing the supply. Um, there is, it, it was very easy to lose Bitcoin in those days. I mean, wallets were not simple. Bitcoin Core was not very usable. Um, I mean, I personally lost, like, I don't know how much, like just trying to experiment with, you know, when we were writing software for Bitcoin. Um, and uh, I, I am a big believer that probably something as high as 20%, 25% of all Bitcoin is, it's unrecoverable. I mean, there's a ton of people who have backups from those days and they never checked if those backups work. 
and I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of surprises. Yeah, what's this uh, goopy stuff spurting out of the ground here? Oh my gosh, it's crude oil. I, I'm worth a billion dollars. You know, this is what happened when the price suddenly went from a penny to a thousand dollars. Yeah, a lot of people suddenly become instant billionaires, or on soon to become instant billionaires, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be equally to the task of responsibly handling handling that billion dollars. So before Bitcoin, there was something called cryptography. Right. And uh, the Satoshi Nakamoto in the Bitcoin phenomenon is, you know, cryptography, the way it works, it could be turned into a currency. Mm -hmm. What was that light bulb moment, I think, and this will be interesting. There's cryptography. It existed before Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. What was Satoshi's insight? What was that, that light bulb moment? What exactly the transition from, aha, cryptography to a currency model? if that's a legitimate question. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, how, how would you describe that? So the first is to make sure that the database is secure. So uh, the ledger itself is secured by a mining process and that mining process relies on a hash algorithm. The second thing is how do you spend your money? Who gives you the right to do that? So it's called public key cryptography. In the particular case of a Bitcoin, it uses ECDSA, elliptic curve digital signing algorithm. And there's, there's two parts, a public address that everybody in the world can know, and that's fine. And then there's a private key that only the person who has the right to spend the money has. So these two things put together actually allow you to create a completely decentralized and trustless currency. Okay, would it be correct to say that the problem Bitcoin solves is double spending? Yes, it solves double spending. Okay, because before then, I could send somebody an electronic token but I could conceivably do that and send it out ten, to 10 people at the same time. Right. Because and that's you, the problem. You needed a central authority to maintain the database to inhibit uh, double spending. But with the hashing algorithm, you actually have digital consensus in a decentralized way to prevent you from counterfeiting. Right. So, so to verify So it creates fact, digital scarcity, in a sense, which is the first thing time that's ever been done. I'll talk a little bit more about that, a digital scarcity. Yeah, so effectively, once you have a database that's secured by consensus, nobody in the ecosystem, nobody in the world can tamper with that unless they gain an overwhelming amount of hash power in the network. So effectively, when you have tokens that are in that database, those tokens are scarce. They can't be cloned or replicated. So just like gold, it has that property, and that's very unique. It's never been done before in a digital sense. The tokens are the bitcoins. Exactly. Right, so you're solving, you're paying the people who are lending their CPU, their computers, mm -hmm. to hash, and in exchange, they're getting a token. Yep. Now those tokens, it just so happens, can be used now like money. And that's why it was an experiment, because when it was first built, the tokens had no value, then you could buy a pizza for uh, you know, 10,000 of them, and now a lot of people are millionaires as a result of uh, the appreciation of value, because they're scarce. <laughs>
this was the end of the amateur era because of all the attention from the Senate in t at the end of 2013, now Mount Gox collapsing. That was huge news. It was covered all around the world. Then we get to July of 2014 and U.S. Marshals auction off nearly 30,000 Bitcoin, uh, 29,656 to be precise. Of the 50,000 Bitcoin, they ultimately got off Ross Ulbricht. It was announced on 1st of July, 2014, that Tim Draper, the billionaire venture capitalist from Silicon Valley, had actually won. And Tim Draper winning those Bitcoin in that auction in itself became a massive story because he was a billionaire venture capitalist from Silicon Valley. And that became a huge story in America. It's like, Tim Draper, why is he buying all these Bitcoin? What's going on? Right, Tim Draper coming in and buying those coins in an auction held by the US government marked the beginning of the next phase. So it marked the beginning of the professionalization of Bitcoin. It marked the beginning of venture capital looking at Bitcoin. It marked the beginning of a serious money starting to put pencil to paper and figure out, okay, what could this thing be worth and who's telling the truth and is it really competitor to gold? Could it compete with Visa? You know, what is the real value of this? And the venture capital business is the business of trying to speculate about what's going to happen in the future almost completely with blinders on. They have no idea. They tend to look at a multiple opportunities hoping one will drop and be successful. Tim Draper looked at Bitcoin and said, you know, if this works, you know, I believe he made the comment, it's either going to be worth a million dollars a coin or zero. And uh, that's a, an acceptable bet for a venture capitalist. And that bet for Tim Draper has paid off spectacularly so far, probably will continue to do so. The, the fact is that people who have made a tremendous amount of money in these markets, like a George Soros, for example, or a Warren Buffett, will do exactly opposite to what the, the shrieking crowd is doing. So when you see the shriekers, that they have a use uh, if you're in the business of making money because they tend to sell at the bottom and buy at the top. Uh, so in the case of Bitcoin, the shrieks are quite loud, which is, uh, by a contrarian point of view, the absolute best time to get into a Bitcoin. Our pri my price target is still, in the short term, $1,400, and in the medium term, more like $10,000 per Bitcoin as the adoption rate skyrockets, and you have all these other businesses that are now plugging into Bitcoin, all the venture capital is plugging into the Bitcoin blockchain. So two years from now, $10,000 per Bitcoin, I think, is in the bag. Obituary number 31, Mount Gox meltdown spells doom for Bitcoin. Here we come with obituary number 36, price 672, quote, Bitcoin is dead, according to the Weekly Standard. Uh, this, this unkillable thing, right, that's had over 300 obituaries, no matter what you throw at Bitcoin, it seems to just continue to keep on fighting. And uh, Bitcoin really at this point, being, this, uh, being on the internet itself for so long has developed this amazing immune system of a community that will continue to fight for Bitcoin, continue to fix Bitcoin, continue to uh, make sure that Bitcoin doesn't go anywhere anytime soon. 2014 is the year that many people will ask today, what did you do during 2014? Because it was known as the previous crypto winter, the bad times, the nothing happening, the price was declining, it was the great bear market. But there was a lot happening during 2014. There were many, this was also the year that a lot of the altcoins started to rise. MaxCoin was created on our show in 2014. And again, this was part of the whole learning process back then, because again, there wasn't as much information available still in 2014 about what Bitcoin was, how these coins were be, being created. We as journalists were like, well, if there are all these new coins coming out, does that mean that Bitcoin isn't worth as much? And we had two young cryptography students on our show to show the audience how a coin is created. We're going to mine the Genesis block right here on this pre-recorded live television show. So open up your laptop, and this is gonna be the, the launch of a crypto Yes. Essentially. Yeah, indeed. This is exactly what happened. Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009. This is the well, moment. We're recreating a moment. that We he are went... recreating an event. Exactly. Right. So what happened just now? So, just... so at the moment, uh, when you mine a Genesis block, you need to set up a few parameters within the code. So we need to give it the time at which we're going to mine it. Um, you specify a particular string. 
something along the lines of Max Kaiser launches his own altcoin. And then you let the transaction work for a little while, then eventually it spits out the hash for the first coin in the blockchain, which is the public ledger that details all of the transactions up to date. And that's what mining constitutes, is adding to that ledger. And it was really educational for us. I learned a lot. And it was an interesting process to see actually how a coin was made. It helped me understand this is a troll community and a lot of people only care about when Lambo. So there are still people to this day who will be like, Where, uh, where's my price rise and things like that. But for us, it was an educational experience of learning how a coin is made and why all these other coins were being created. Well, the community is indefatigable. And during Bitcoin's price slump, they decided, well, we're just going to create a whole bunch of these coins to see if we can't come up with something that gets some traction and start moving up in price and keep the party going. The supply of Bitcoin into the market kept really prices down because there was a flood of those auctions, of those government sales, and you got to chew through a lot of overhead resistance, and this is going to take a while. So while we're waiting, you might as well just create some altcoins, some different coins, different features, different ideas. But this is when the idea of Bitcoin maximalist came around, and it was an idea floated by Vitalik Buterin, who was the guy behind Ethereum. And Ethereum was positioned as superior to Bitcoin. And that was uh, an insult to say you were a Bitcoin maximalist at that time, uh, that you needed to embrace alternative coin ideas. And so you had a hardened group of what we now call maximalists who hunkered down and said that we're not going to stray from the reservation. We're going to stay right here with Bitcoin, and we're going to harden our defense of Bitcoin, and we're going to start to get involved in these meme wars and these shouting matches online about whether or not this coin is actually garbage uh, versus Bitcoin and all these other coins. And th this is uh, really the beginning of the coin wars. Let's uh, step back for a second and talk about altcoins in general, because you had the creation of Bitcoin back in the 2009 period, it's a cryptocurrency. And then we've seen now altcoins, which are also cryptocurrencies. They're similar to Bitcoin. They're, they have variations, as you mentioned. There's a pre-mining going on. So why, uh, why do we have these altcoins to begin with? What is the purpose of them? Well, I don't want to generalize all altcoins, but basically I think a lot of them are basically pump and dumps. So there are a few uh, projects that are a lot more interesting than some of like the uh, altcoins that don't really change anything. Like you got Mastercoin, you got Ethereum, you got some other projects like Next. They're doing a it's all proof of stake peer coin. So there's a few that actually do uh, try something new and give uh, people something new in the cryptocurrency world. Uh, but for the ma the majority of them are uh, I, I don't want to say worthless, but not really worth anyone's time looking at. Yeah, you know, the creator of Bitcoin is anonymous, and at that moment, that seemed like a liability, that they wanted to have an accountable figurehead behind a coin. And so projects entered the space, and uh, within a few months, uh, there would be a lot of tension between these projects, and uh, the Bitcoin core group uh, would become an entrenched kind of hunkered it down group that uh, was doing battle, you know, from all corners of the community. And that, that's when it first starts to bifurcate, I would say, between the Bitcoin hard liners and what became the rest of the coin universe, the altcoins. By definition, an altcoin is an alternative to Bitcoin. That's where the word came from. Um, and if we're looking at alternatives to Bitcoin, I don't think there is one. Um, I think Bitcoin has a unique place at achieving sound money. Um, but put into that basket of altcoins are things that have confused a lot of people of, of their identity and what they are. So we have people that have used the technology uh, that Bitcoin brought to the world in order to create um, systems that create disruption in, for example, capital markets. And if you're creating something that, uh, a blockchain that creates disruption in capital markets, you don't actually want it to have the same principles as sound money. 
um, you wouldn't want it to be expensive. You wouldn't want it to be inflation resistant. Um, you'd want the ability to pay for these things they call smart contracts to be quite cheap. Um, and so what people have done is they've, they've taken over, over our history, we've got very confused. We had Bitcoin, then people created alternatives to Bitcoin and all of those in my eye fell and none of them have become an alternative to Bitcoin. Um, but over that, the technology has been used and then we've called them coins when really it's more appropriate to call them tokens or, or different things um, because they, they have different use cases. Bitcoin got adoption without a figurehead, without a central personality. In 2014, when the media came sniffing about, they needed to talk to somebody. And so they talked to people who were in the space who then took that media spotlight and decided to turn that into a coin project. So it was the opposite of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin filled a need and it came about organically through the cypher punk movement. The altcoins filled a space called the spotlight and it brought about a bunch of what I would call false prophets, false Satoshis who had coins but they had really nothing behind them of substance. And it's also important to establish in 2014 the emergence of those altcoins. They were not free money in the way that we would then see later in 2017 with ICOs. It was experimentation still in 2014. I believe that there are a few altcoins that perhaps were legitimately created as interesting science projects. But in the future, going out five, ten years, there's really no need for them because if they happen to innovate something, which I doubt, it could be absorbed into Bitcoin. And to me, I'm a believer in Adam Smith's work where you're only your country, your nation, is only as good as the brain power of its smartest people and the smartest people are coding on Bitcoin. That's where all the innovation is happening. And that Bitcoin is going to advance way faster than the old coins. So December 2014, the year ends with the US Marshals auction off the final stash of Silk Road coins. Honey Badger still didn't care. Honey Badger don't care. Honey Badger don't care. Honey Badger won't care. Bitcoin does whatever it wants. Every time you try to kill it or ban it or whatever, it gets stronger and stronger. I wish I had my Honey Badger baseball cap that says proof of keys on it. Yeah, yeah, Honey Badger don't care.